Capo is here. Otto Frank, now 68, has re remarried and lives in Switzerland. Of the eight who lived in the secret annex, he's the only survivor. A handsome, soft-spoken man of obviously great intelligence. He, regular, he regularly answers correspondence that comes to him about his daughter from all over the world. He recently went to Hollywood for a consultation on a movie version of The Diary of Anne Frank. About the events of that August morning in 1944, Mr. Frank told me, I was showing Peter Van Dan his spelling mistakes when suddenly someone came running up the stairs. The steps creaked and I started to my feet for it was morning when everyone was supposed to be quiet. But then the door flew open and a man stood before us holding his pistol aimed at my chest. In the main room, the others were already assembled. My wife and the children, the Van Dans, were standing there with raised hands. Then Albert Dussel came in, followed by another stranger. In the middle of the room stood a uniformed policeman. He stared into our faces. Where do you, where are your valuables? He asked. I pointed to the cupboard where my cash box was kept. The policeman took it out. Then he looked around and his eye fell on the leather briefcase where Anne kept her diary and all her papers. He opened it and shook everything out, dumped the contents on the floor so that Anne's papers and notebooks and the loose sheets lay scattered at her feet. No one spoke and the policeman didn't even glance at the mess on the floor as he put our valuables into the briefcase and closed it. He asked us whether we had any weapons, but we had none, of course. Then he said, get ready. Who betrayed the occupants of the secret annex? No one is sure, but some suspicion centers on a man I can only call M, whom the living, the living remember as a crafty and disagreeable sneak. He was a warehouse clerk hired after the Franks moved into the building, and he was never told of their presence. M used to come to work early in the mornings and once found a locked briefcase which Mr. Van Dan had carelessly left in the office, where he sometimes worked in the dead of night. Though Crawler claimed it was his own briefcase, it is possible the clerk suspected. Little signs led to bigger conclusions. In the course of the months he had worked in the building, M might have gathered many such signs. The dial on the radio left at BBC by nocturnal listeners, Slight rearrangements in the office furniture and, of course, small inexplicable, that means unexplainable, sounds from the back of the building. M was tried later at a war crimes court, denied everything, and was acquitted. No one knows where he is now. I made no effort to find him. Neither did I search out Silbertaler, the German police sergeant who made the arrest. The betrayers would have told me nothing. Ironically enough, the occupants of the secret annex had grown optimistic in the last weeks of their self-imposed confinement. The terrors of those first nights had largely faded. Even the German army communiques, that means communications, made clear that the war was approaching an end. The Russians were well into Poland, on the Western Front, Americans had broken through at Avranches and were pouring into the heart of France. Holland must be liberated soon. In her diary, Anne Frank wrote that she thought she might be back in school by fall. Now that they were all packing of the capture, Otto Frank recalled, no one wept. Anne was very quiet and composed, only just as dispirited as the rest of us. Perhaps that was why she did not think to take along her notebooks, which lay scattered about on the floor. But maybe she too had the premonition that all was lost now, everything, everything. And so she walked back and forth and did not even glance at her diary. As the captains filed out of the building, Meep sat listening. I heard them going, she said, first in the corridor and then down the stairs. I could hear the heavy boots and the footsteps, and then the very light footsteps of Anne. Through the years, she had taught herself to walk so softly 
that you could hear her only if you knew what to listen for. I did not see her, for the office door was closed as they all passed by. At Gestapo headquarters, the prisoners were interrogated only briefly. As Otto Frank pointed out to his questioners, it was unlikely, after 25 months in the secret annex, that he would know the whereabouts of any other Jews who were hiding in Amsterdam. The Franks, the Van Dans, and Dussel were kept at police headquarters for several days, the men in one cell, the women in the other. They were relatively comfortable there. The food was better than the food they had in the secret annex, and the guards left them alone. Suddenly, all eight were taken to the railroad station and put on a train. The guards named their destination Westerbork, a concentration camp for Jews in Holland, about 80 miles from Amsterdam. Mr. Frank said, we rode in a regular passenger train. The fact that the door was bolted did not matter very much. We were together and we had been given a little food for the journey. We were actually cheerful, cheerful at least, when I compare that journey to our next. We had already anticipated the possibility that we might not remain in Westerbork. To the end, we knew what was happening to Jews in Auschwitz. But weren't the Russians already deep into Poland? We hoped our luck would hold. As we rode, Anne would not move from the window. It was summer outside. Meadows, stubble fields, and villages flew by. The telephone wires along the right of way curved up and down along the windows. After two years, it was like freedom for her. Can you understand that? Among the names given me of survivors who had known the Franks at Westerbork was that of Mrs. DeWick, De who lives in Appledorn, Holland. I visited Mrs. DeWick in her home, a lovely, gracious woman, she told me that her family, like the Franks, had been hiding for months before their capture. She said, we had been at Westerbork three or four weeks when the, world, when the word went around that there were new arrivals. News of that kind ran like wildfire through the camp. And my daughter, Judy, came running to me, calling, new people are coming, mama. The newcomers were standing in a long row in the mustering square and one of the clerks was entering their names on a list. We looked at them, and Judy pressed close against me. Most of the people in the camp were adults, and I, I had often wished for a, a young friend for Judy, who was only 15. As I looked along the line, fearing I might see someone I knew, I suddenly exclaimed, Judy, see? In the long line stood eight people, whose faces, white as paper, told you at once that they had been hiding and had not been in the open air for years. Among them was this girl. And I said to Judy, look, there is a friend for you. I saw Anne Frank and Peter Van Dan every day in Westerbork. They were always together. And I often said to my husband, look at those two beautiful young people. Anne was so radiant that her beauty flowed over into Peter. Her eyes glowed and her movements had a lilt to, to them. She was very pallid, that means pale, at first. But there was some thing so attractive about her frailty and her expressive face that at first Judy was too shy to make friends. Anne was happy there, incredible as it seems. Things were hard for us in the camp. We, convict Jews, who had been arrested in hiding places, had to wear blue overalls with a red bib and wooden shoes. Our men had their heads shaved. 300 people lived in each barracks. We were sent to work at five in the morning, the children to a cable workshop and the grown-ups to a shed where we had to break up old batteries and salvage the metal and the carbon rods. The food was bad, and we always kept on the run, and the guards all screamed, faster, faster. But Anne was happy. It was as if she had been liberated. Now she could see new people and talk to them and could laugh. She could laugh while the rest of us thought nothing but, will they send us to the camps in Poland? Will we live through it? Edith Frank, Anne's mother, 
seemed numbed by the experience. She could have been a mute. Anne's sister, Margot, spoke little, and Otto Frank was quiet too. But his was a reassuring quietness that helped Anne and all of us. He lived in the men's barracks, but once when Anne was sick, he came over to visit her every evening and would stand beside her bed for hours telling her stories. Anne was so like him. When another child, a 12-year-old boy named David, fell ill, Anne stood by his bed and talked to him. David came from an Orthodox family, and he and Anne always talked about God. Anne Frank stayed at Westerbork only three weeks. Early in September, a thousand of the convict Jews were put on a freight train, 75 people to a car. Brussels fell to the Allies, and Antwerp, and then the Americans reached, reached Aachen. The victories were coming too late. The Franks and their friends were already on their way to Auschwitz, the camp in Poland, where four million Jews died. Mrs. DeWick was in the same freight car as the Franks on the journey from Westerbork to Auschwitz. Now and then, when the train stop, stopped, she told me, the SS guards came to the door and held out their caps, and we had to toss our money and valuables into the caps. Anne and Judy sometimes pulled themselves up to the small barred window of the car and described the villages we were passing through. We made the children repeat the addresses where we could meet up after the war if we became separated in a camp. I remember that the Franks chose a meeting place in Switzerland. I sat beside my husband on a small box. On the third day in the train, my husband suddenly took my hand and said, I want to thank you for the wonderful life we have had together. I snatched my hand away from his, crying, what, what are you thinking about? It's not over. But he calmly reached for my hand again and took it and repeated several times, thank you. Thank you for the life we have had together. Then I left my hand in his and did not try to draw it away. On the third night, the train stopped and the doors of the car slid violently open. And the first, and the first, the exhausted passengers saw of Auschwitz was the glaring searchlights fixed on the train. On the platform, capos, criminal convicts who were assigned to positions of authority over other, over the other prisoners were running back and forth shouting orders. Behind them, seen distinctly against the light, stood the SS officers, trimly built and smartly uniformed, many of them with huge dogs at their sides. As people poured out of the train, a loudspeaker 